to introduce uh, Professor Susan Wodker from the University of Oros in Denmark. Uh, Susan has been one of the pioneers of participatory design back in the early 80s. Um, and uh, she's now uh, she's now starting a uh, DRC advanced grants on common interactive objects. And she's been working on the team of artifact ecologies that she's going to talk about today for, for a long period now. And uh, she's one of the main figures in HCI. And, uh, and uh, she's, if, if you have ever heard of the three ways of HCI, it's, it's her, her fault. And, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, every year. Actually volunteered to do this to give this talk without being asked, and that is a pleasure. And, uh, so thank you. I hope so, you like it. Otherwise, it's entirely on me. Yeah, I guess I'm saying just for starters a few things. I, one is that I put up this cartoon uh, to to say that I, I find it very interesting to study how technology has changed the way we live and interact. I'm actually not going to talk about Facebook today at all, so I'll just leave it with this too. Um, but I will talk about development, I mean human development and technology development. I'll talk about uh, artifacts and artifact ecologies. And of course, I, since I am a computer scientist deep down, I'll also talk a bit about primarily uh, software and maybe a little bit less about physical things. Um, so, I talk about artifacts and artifact ecologies, how to design them, and I'll in this use mainly three cases, one of which you might have heard of because Peter Lyle was working on it. But I'm, I talk about how people appropriate iPhones, I talk about this thing called almost organic food community that Peter was actually working with when he was in office. And I'll talk about a case that we call local area artworks. So, already, for instance, Winterberg and Flores back in 1986 talked about how tools both help us act and help us uh, transform ourselves, and in that version, also uh, the possible roles of technologies in this. In particular, they used this kind of perspective to criticize AI, which was also a rising topic back in 1986. Uh, it probably is again in some form or another. Um, but they also point out that in this, that the human development is actually an important issue for design and technology when they talk about how we continue becoming the beings that we are. Uh, I worked with activity theoretical HCI since the 1980s and uh, I'll also here use this uh, foundation to uh, suggest some better tools for understanding and designing technological artifacts and computer mediated activities in the, in the many forms that we know them today. So in activity theory, the basic unit of analysis is activity where human beings together achieve something uh, in a praxis mediated by tools, language, etc. Um, human activity develops over time in a dialectical relationship with the tools, the materials, and the routines that uh, they sort of come, grow, to, grow up together with. Artifacts, in this way of thinking, <coughs> made by humans for humans. Uh, and, and, and this is both in the sense that, that uh, they support, uh, so, so, so they're made with a purpose, with a motive, and a way in which they can be handled, you can say, in mind. Again, Pascal again talks about instrumentation as the work that it takes for the user to make an artifact her own. Uh, 
the user, yeah. So that's instrumentation. But activity is also crystallized into artifacts in two ways, both in, in, as externalization of operations with early artifacts, and also in a sense as representations of the program acting in a given activity. Victor uh, Kaptilini talks about artifacts as becoming functional organs. It's a bit of a strange word, I would say, in English. But, but what he means is really that, that artifacts extend the boundaries of the human being outwards in a similar way as Pellini talks about the, the blind man seeing with the stick. In um, activity theory, we, we've, uh, we distinguish between uh, motive, goal, the goal orientation, and the conditions for action, and we call that activity, action, and operation. Bans and Natalie did a paper from uh, uh, an Olympic conference some years ago, talked about this and talked about how we can ask the questions of why, what, and how to look at this. In uh, some more recent work with uh, Timmy's club, who's we tried to, in a sense, we like this idea that Captain kept a functional organs, which basically means that things have a, a human side and an artifact side with these three levels of uh, why, what, and how. And we have done a lot of it, analysis of this uh, to talk about the dialectics between the human side and the artifact side, and also how, how uh, the human use, the human activity develops. So, we, you can say we use this human artifact model, as we call it. Uh, we both use that to make analysis where, in a sense, we put the human being in the middle and ask questions about the relationships between how the human being handles a variety of different technologies and how the human being transfer understanding and skill at both the one one and the how level across these these devices. And we also have a main analysis where we put the technology in the middle and understood that and how it supports a variety of different human activities. And the fun figure is actually from the paper that, that Tins and I originally published on this, where we took um, a paper by Brian and all that, that's about how how people become Wikipedians as they talk about it. And we um, we sort of replicate the transformation that they describe for newcomers that become Wikipedians through the use of Wikipedia. What's really interesting in, in the Brian and Lord's paper about this is actually that they're pointing out that, that not only is this transformation from newcomer to becoming Wikipedian, so the human transformation, but it is actually also different elements of the technology that supports these diff different parts of this transformation. And we and we try to use the uh, the, the human artifact model to to, uh, to analyze that. But before we even started to uh, to talk about human artifacts and and artifact ecologies as these variety of artifacts that are connected through human use or around human use. We actually did quite a few studies of what we early on called uh, multimediation. I worked with Olaf Battlesman with uh, the late Peter Bill Anderson to study how these multiplicities happen. So one example is really a chain or what we also call a juxtaposition of uh, of, uh, of mediation that's happening when when the uh, when the wastewater worker basically walks around the wastewater plant and transforms numbers that he read or reads off meters in some places and write them down in this little notepad and put them elsewhere. And we also we, 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 uh, in the study with Peter Rianus, we we did some rather elaborate studies or rather he did of uh, work on a ship bridge of a huge cargo vessel where he basically made some analysis to say that, well,
sometimes this uh, ship, when it's out in open waters, it can basically be, be driven or, or you know, used by the car. I don't think if this guy is standing there and he's basically driving the, uh, the ship. But when it needs to get closer to the shore or into harbors, it's a much more elaborate set of many people doing different things, using many different instruments to make this happen. So the guy on, on the ship bridge will have lookouts at either side of the ship. There will be people down in the engine room doing other things and they will be communicating with each other. And uh, there may also be several people on the ship bridge doing different things. So we're talking about how these uh, how these levels of, of mediation is happening and how sometimes one artifact substitutes for another under different conditions. Um, Michel Bonan Lafonguis also talked in human computer interaction specifically about what he calls instrumental interaction, talks about beta instruments, which is basically uh, the instruments that we use to make instruments. And uh, that's, of course, also a kind of multi-mediation. So I guess you could argue that the guy in the wastewater car, when he draws the, the columns in his little notebook, it's actually a form of a meta instrument to actually write in, in the numbers and moving them, of course. So the idea of artifact ecology, so multiple mediation has very many forms that, that we've actually analyzed and understood with this framework and we worked on for quite many years. Uh, when we then start talking about uh, artifact ecologies, it's because I personally think that, that it's very difficult today to analyze in an ACI kind of way just one person using one technology. There's almost always multimediation. There's almost always multiple activities and, multi and many people working together in what we sometimes call web of activities and web of artifacts. And that's actually in a sense something that I find even more important now than, than, than it was early on because I think most of the examples that we also I'll talk about now, it, you know, it's neither man nor technology is really an island. So we, 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 we need to struggle to find analytic ways of understanding these multiplicities. And I think that's, that's basically, in a sense, my, my, my purpose here. But I also think that it's important to say that these are dynamic and these are developing all the time. So, some years ago, I uh, did some interviews with people who had at the time just uh, acquired iPhones. Uh, it was at the time when people started to move from more classical cell phones to iPhones. I, I would actually say I repeated these interviews last, or this year and I haven't written up the, uh, the new results, but I think they're pretty boring. I think pretty much the iPhone has now come to the point where it's no longer an interesting technology for anybody. But it was some years ago, and I'll talk a little bit more on why, why this study is interesting. When, when we did the analysis of these iPhone interviews, we were very focused on how people appropriate technologies and how in particular they appropriate these iPhones from you. And we were, we were doing that from two perspectives. One is a paper uh, in Bolinardi's book about context and consciousness by Anna Reitzel and uh, Boris Benishkovsky, where they talk about how it is that actions, that is the work that we develop uh, deliberately, habitually, and ontogenetically, as they call it, uh, by the individual as part of a relevant community of practice. Activity, the Y level, is something that, that develops historically and social-culturally and also micro-socially. 
And, and the how learning your operations are learned um, by imitation, basically, is the point, and they are often not even conscious. So, of course, we are interested in these three levels of how, how we have this uh, deliberate and habitual level, the what level, uh, the cultural level, the why, and also then these, these, these habits and routine, uh, or routines uh, that are learned. Another thing uh, is that, that uh, I've been quite inspired by, uh, in particular, Jim Virch's use of uh, Bakhtin's language theory. I mean, I also tried to read Bakhtin, but it's not so easy. But anyway, Bakhtin says that, and he talks about language, and he says, a word, when we learn, when we learn language, a word is first somebody else's, and then uh, being picked up, it becomes half somebody else's and half one's own. It becomes one's own only when populated with one's own intentions, one's accent, when one appropriates it. So, you can say that, that, or at least the claim I'm making is that when we also pick up new technologies, this is not only about, about language, it's first somebody else's. I don't have the routines for it, I don't have the, we need the motivation for it, I don't have anything for it, but I, but, but somebody else does, and I, I kind of um, pick up on that and see that. Then it becomes half mine, and then finally it gets these local accents and so on. And what happened when we then analyzed the iPhone uh, interviews, so, so I, I basically interviewed people who had recently acquired an iPhone. And, uh, and then I also interviewed some of them a year later. So I both had the sort of, uh, I could both hear what they were talking about when, when the phone was fairly new, but also see how they got back to it later. And so what happens when, when we talk about this, uh, what people talk about when they talk about the new phone is basically this idea of somebody else's. One of the things that a lot of people were complaining about at the time was how big and chunk and clunky the, the basically uh, the iPhone was compared to your Nokia 3310 or whatever. And they kept complaining about that in a certain way. At least it was an issue to begin with. There was also at the one hand this idea that by buying an Apple product you get it a smart and elegant phone. And there was certainly also at the one hand this idea that by, by also buying an iPhone I would do as the rest of my peer group, my group of friends, my, the people at work or whatever. Then when people were starting to use this, they, there were some issues again on both the why, the one and the how they were starting from the bottom. Everybody complained that texting was more difficult on a smartphone than it was on the, on the Nokia. I mean, it's interesting that, that uh, I, I think we've forgotten, but I think we were actually all rather annoyed when we got our first smartphone and we had to send text messages using these, uh, uh, the, this glass uh, keyboard. Whereas, you know, when they, I remember my son who was 10 or something, he, he said, Mom, I can text you from my pocket, like with, or with his Nokia or something. And, and I was saying, no, you can't. And he said, yes, I can. And so he did, of course. And, and there's just not a chance in the world that you can do that with an iPhone. So anyway, but there was something that, that we start with them at least to begin with. Uh, then, at the right level, people started to think about their iPhone as something else than just a telephone. So the idea that all of a sudden we realized you could send email messages or you could browse the web or do some sort of surfing while you were out and about was actually some, one, some of these things that made people start to reconsider what it was they had in their hand. Some people were uh, quite con 
concerned about what this would mean for, uh, for, for, you know, would they bring work home? What would they bring their private life to work, for instance, with this? And this is kind of in this half mind situation. And then the interesting thing is actually said to what happened then when they had appropriated the technology and it had become all mine or all theirs. Um, actually, I wrote a paper with Christensen about this, and we, that paper is called Poetry in Motion. I was actually, because one of the guys um, was talking about how he didn't, he was a high school student, he didn't like mathematics, and uh, so sometimes he found math class really boring. So what he had was to, he had installed this uh, poetry, uh, poetry thing, I don't know, the particular website or something where it was easy to read poetry. And so that was what he did when he was bored in, in math class. So, so it had become, his phone had become this poetry machine for him. There was another guy, and this is more on the one, one level, who said he, he basically had the iPhone because he wanted to consider how, how to make an app that would be a cookbook. He was a professional chef. And then a lot of people had these decisive moments where they realized on the how level that now they had sort of appropriated the, the access that you would get through it. So one guy talks about how he was standing at the bus stop one day and before, before he knew it, he had booked a hairdresser, he had checked the schedule at school and a few other things and all of a sudden he, real, he realized that now, now this had become a thing for him that, that he would do in his regular life and a routine for him. Um, I also did some further analysis of the uh, of this uh, smart or this iPhone study with clean drug moves and we have an article where we talk about of course how these artifact technologies and how the, the phone is actually an example of an artifact because how, what happens in, in this perspective when a new technology gets introduced. So we try to analyze, uh, you can say, this, this iPhone story pretty much from sort of a physics kind of perspective of thinking about unsatisfactory, excited and stable states and how what happens when the new iPhone sort of moves into an artifact ecology is, a, is first that, that it, it's, it's, it sort of shakes and, and moves out some of the, of the other technologies that we have and eventually some of them are actually made redundant. So for instance, in the, in the interviews it was pretty clear that, that people very soon gave up on having separate uh, 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 music players and separate cameras and stuff like that. And then when, when those have sort of been sent away, there's a more stable state where, where nothing much happens. But, but people are starting to talk about how they, what their next needs would be. And this was actually when I did the interviews right at the time when the iPads came out or was so nobody had iPads just yet, but they talked about it. And so a lot of people also had speculations about how, what, what would they need an iPad and what for? And actually, I will say that the reading was one of the things that came up as something that people could see a, a need for a bigger screen and so on and so forth. Um, so, so this is. Uh, to say that, that this is one way I've studied these artifact economies and it does say something about the appropriation and how uh, a new artifact sort of moves in and, and changes uh, what we're doing. And in another study, which is slightly different, uh, we, we did a design for an art gallery in August, which was basically uh, sort of as an attempt to uh, democratize uh, curation, you can say. So instead of having these sheets of paper put next to the art pieces, we would have an iPad there and 
If you walk up to the art piece, you could get a copy of uh, the text on the iPad on your on your phone, and you could you could change the text. Um, so that was running in this exhibition for a while. I'll just show you. I didn't. I guess I'm too polite to do that. 
So uh, we were thinking about this in a, in a way as in, inspired by some early work, also by my, uh, my former PhD student, Tola Benson and Yara Bachman, where they talk about the development and the creation of technology as the technology first sort of offering or appealing to an initial familiarity and then ultimately also offering new uses. And you can of course also think about the iPhone thing that I just talked about in, in that same way. But in this particular case, we, we were sort of thinking about what is it that makes people, what, what do people recognize? So they talk about this A4 sheet that you normally see on, on the wall in our areas. Talk about the phone, they talk about the Facebook wall as is this, or, or this stream of comments as an alternative to really to this A4 thing. But they are also interested in sort of developing the ideas that this might be used to ultimately discuss with the artists, uh, to edit other people's text, to read the comments also when, when you are away. So the point was that through this uh, proximity, as it was called, you could only edit the text when you were close to the iPad, but you could actually go home and read it when you were away. And so, do this instead, because this is actually the six iPads that we had, and, and how the uh, how the, the the text kind of developed over the time. Um, so so anyway, we were pretty much thinking about this as, you know, is it at all in, the, in a sense a good design idea to uh, have this iPad and think about that as an A4 piece? Is it at all good that people should take out their phone in the art gallery, which was also one of the things that people were quite worried about as we were also talking about, or should we have done something entirely different? I don't think we have the answer to whether we should have done something entirely different, but certainly um, the idea of thinking about the difference between what people see and what we thought and what they were then talking about, what they wanted to have, we actually found this as sort of an interesting spectrum actually, but also saying that both the curators and the artists were actually also interested, both in the comments as they were happening, but also in potentially having this kind of dialogue with, with, the, with the audience. And this, the exhibition was sort of a graduation exhibition from a local art college. And of course, I think some technology like this would have looked rather different if it had been put up in an art museum where, say, a lot of people were passing, say, next to the Mona Lisa, for instance. It might also have been more interesting for people to see comments about some new crazy white art piece, see comments about this also when they came home. I, I think it was actually slightly artificial in this particular one. So the last case, which is the one that, that Peter Lyon was involved with, um, we started to work with an organic food community with 900 members who were organizing that sale of uh, local organic food produce in, in, in Aarhus. And uh, they organized around this idea that, that uh, they were selling the products from particular local farmers and that the members should also volunteer community work. And a lot of what the activities that they had were centered around both packaging and, and handing out these, uh, these, this food, but also organizing these uh, schedules for who takes turn packing up the, uh, the, uh, the vegetables when, and, and so on. Um, so, so, for instance, in this case, we, we, were, we realized that this physical meeting where where people were coming on Thursday afternoon to pick up their, their goodies was actually very important for, for the entire community, for the members to meet, for 
mobilizing volunteers or, and also simply for the visibility of the community. Whereas their online presence was, presence was maybe less, I mean, it, they had something working and they were struggling with it, but, but, it, but, but it, the, the, the meeting, that meeting meeting was very important for this sort of visibility. We started, this is actually when we started to, to do these artifact ecology mappings that you may have seen Peter, Peter work with, where we, uh, where we asked members about their everyday artifact ecology and how that uh, fed into the artifact ecology of this community. So we saw, for instance, how members tailored and appropriated a payment system so that, for instance, you could use a credit card terminal on this meeting every week. And uh, we also saw how uh, sometimes people, the, the members' personal artifact ecologies were extending into this community artifact ecology and the other way around. Um, so throughout the study, and this was from the first day we talked to them and to the last day we talked to them, they continued to imagine a new and better website that would solve all their problems. And uh, they tried to enroll technically competent members to build this. Uh, they brought their various skills to the table, but they were also busy. And uh, it happened more than once in the time we were there that the, the tech, tech guy gave up because he was too busy and they were left with something that was only halfway working and that had been designed in a very idiosyncratic way because of the way this particular guy moved this particular platform. And the next person taking over then had this issue that, that he or she possibly knew and understood another technical platform and couldn't really see what, what had happened and what design choices had been made. Um, so there was this issue of coming and going that was rather important for, for the development of the artifact ecology. And um, as I said, this new website continued to be a thing. In, in one of the papers, we, uh, we used the uh, Pippin and Wolves, uh, <laughs> we talked about that, but uh, their figure for their points of infrastructure and to talk about how, how uh, in, this, uh, in this development of the artifact ecology, this kind of the community, there were these points when the technologies were, were taken in and infrastructures were made. But it was also always a tension between uh, the strategies that were trying to, that would be the point, we want a better website, or we want to be able to handle credit card payment. And then, in a sense, what could, could actually happen? The, the tactics is one thing, but also we, we talk about in one of the papers we have about this, of happens things, things that just happen to be in a particular way because somebody has all of a sudden know how to fix this or because somebody has a thing that can be reactivated towards, towards a particular purpose in the, in the community. So, with this, what are then the challenges for design? Uh, and I think, for me, with all these things about artifact ecologies and multiplicity that I've talked about here, um, it's pretty unavoidable that we need to move out of thinking about designing and building one technology at a time. Because there are already multiple technologies there. Whatever community we move into, uh, there are already technologies there. They are used by various people in multiple activities across multiple communities. So for instance, with the food community, the, the, the practices with technologies that people have from work or from studying or from whatever were brought into this and, and shaped the artifact ecology of the uh, of the food community in a particular way. Um, I think this this multiplicity kind of challenges how we think about 
about learning and cooperation and sharing in, in this kind of context. Um, and I think, I mean, we need more detailed analysis and we need to build and explore more interaction that explicitly is concerned with the sort of the background, the artifact qualities of the users. And this is partly what I'm going to do with my ESC grant, but I think I will just talk a little bit more about something I didn't do, but I find interesting in that. And one of these things is actually the, a paper that Ian Bannon wrote to, uh, together with Victor Cartagini, or rather maybe, actually, yeah, I think Ian wrote it with Victor, but I mean, a lot of it was Victor's uh, background work, where they talk about technology-enhanced activity space. And they talk about this Instead, I mean, maybe this is another way of thinking about artifact ecologies. By, by technology and hand activity spaces, we mean a spatially and temporarily organized configuration of resources, including digital technologies, which enable an individual or a group to carry out one activity or several coordinated activities. This is technology enhanced activity spaces. They go on then to think. To, to talk about how these, uh, how in these technology enhanced activity spaces, uh, we can we can understand what they then call technology enabled practice transformation, and and they 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 distinguish between practice transformation that happens from the outside and practice transformation that then happens from the inside. So. Designers and users, and then they argue, and maybe this is the, the bit I'm the least happy with. And when I talk to him about it, he, he thinks I'm over exaggerating. But anyway, um, they basically argue that that the intrinsic process transformation it, done by the users themselves is good, whereas the extrinsic tra practice transformation coming from the outside by designers is bad. I mean, I may be slightly overstating it, but, but it's kind of the argument they, they're making. And to be honest, I think we, we need to have both. We need to both have technologies that are more easily uh, accommodating these sort of by the users, intrinsic practice transformation. But every once in a while, we also, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, have technologies that, that come from the outside and into a community of practice. And I think if we, if we are to think about how we design, we sort of need to embrace both. We can't just say that, that oh, it's good as, as long as the users can do it themselves, it's bad every time something needs to happen from the outside. So I think in a certain way I, it's important to, to build technologies that are more open for these local appropriation, local intrinsic practice transformation to use the capsule in the Netherlands terms. But I think there's also a role for designers and for participatory designers in thinking about how we can then provide both the uh, the infrastructure and elements or the technology that open up the space but also how we strategically can can work to to get in a sense the right technologies in place also from the outside and that's actually so I just wanted to end, or want to end with saying that, that I've been involved in writing two papers recently that are mainly about projects that I haven't done myself. Uh, one is a paper that was in uh, a CSCW special issue on infrastructure, uh, I don't know, some months ago, where I wrote together with Christian Dittler and Uri Newerstein where we talked about a lot of the work that they've done uh, in, regarding technologies for and in the school systems. And I have, 
a paper accepted for a special issue about Princess uh, uh, Science Special Issue of Tokai, together with Morten Kuhn, where we're actually discussing some of the work that Morten has been doing in setting up um, open source platforms for, for uh, work and development of technology in the health sector in general. But we talk a lot about the many different levels that where one has to actually work strategically to have these things activated into the uh, into the uh, to the use situations. I think both of those are actually good examples of why participatory design is also strategic and, and tactic in in the terms that also uh, as also Pippa and Wolf talks about it, and not just a matter of working with a smaller group of users to may have them achieve something here and now. So um, I hope this was not all too confusing and I'm sort of intending to end it here. Thank you.